2023 of the Indie Street Podcast. I'm your host, Kay, also known as Indie Street Unravel. Um, sorry, I'm looking down a little bit. I'm just trying to get ready for our administrati this week. I never have anything to start up to go with, typically. So this is an out of turn. Do you want to say welcome to everyone that's joining me as well as before, and welcome to any new viewers this week. Thanks for checking me out. Um, and we had a giveaway in the raft group for some cooking. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to give that away because I hate when people do giveaways and I do it at the end, like the anticipation token. I still watch the whole episode, but I basically just want to know who won the giveaway. To start it off, to get pressure off. I hardly ever win anything. I think in the last, I don't know, since Ravelry came about and contacts that were more publicized, I guess. Um, I've entered into several, but I've only ever won two. So I think in like five years I've won two giveaways. So I don't have that high of a chance, but come on. So these are what we're giving away. They are so pinkies. One um, portion of it is a really wonderful staff breeze orange. It's yellowing it out a little bit on this, but it's actually um, quite orange in person. And then this back side is blue, purple, and it looks red, but it's um, leaning pink. So pretty. So this is a sampler, I would say it's an ounce. Um, maybe a little bit more. And we had uh, 11 people enter that giveaway. So let's get up the random number generator for you guys. And see if I can get it open. So we're going to generate that number. And it's number 10. Whew. So that was uh, Ricky, R-E-I-K-I, that won that. So congratulations. Just send me your address, and I will send these out to speak to you. So PM me on Ravelry would be best, please. You can also send me an email um, via my blog. And I will get you both. Fantastic. I am looking at doing more giveaways. I have some plans. Um, and on that note, I have a thread in the Ravelry group called Ideal Giveaway. And basically, I just want to know what you guys want to receive as a giveaway prize. It's really hard to plan stuff. I never know what some of you all receive, what people are interested in. And so I'm kind of just taking guesses. So instead of taking a lot of guesses, I would rather you guys tell me and then I can have giveaways and hopefully can win exactly what you want. So just go in there. It doesn't matter if these patterns, if these books. Um, it could, you, you could be specific if you want. You could say, I want this in desire and this color done. You never know. So um, let me know what you guys want, and then um, I will do my next round of giveaways. I have um, several plans. Um, but I just want enough feedback in there so I can pick some really great prizes. Okay. So um, I have a lot to cover today, so I'm going to try to move a little bit, a little bit quickly so I can get to the sweater portion. So what I am knitting. Unfortunately, I'm still knitting the blanket. So this is the Hourglass Throw by Ann Hansen. And I'll show you where I am. It's getting so big, you guys. Seriously, all of that just unravel it. Unravel it. And again, I'm in the middle of the world. Aren't I always? Oh, goodness. It's actually the back side. And that's the front side. So last week I was I'm seeing covering my face. I was down here. So I knit pretty well. I knit about four hundred yards on it, a little bit more. Four hundred and twenty five yards maybe. And so I stopped um, because I ran out of yarn. And after joining this game. And it's my last game, kind of. It's the last game um, for this pattern. I'm going to be at the measurements of the pattern that calls for, and that's within the yardage allotment of the medium-sized throw. So when I was going through my stash and I was seeing what I had and what I didn't have and what I wanted to do for giveaways, I came across another skein of the woolies, um, and this is 25% uh, wool and 75% acrylic, and it's in the exact same colorway. That stain is, I don't know, years old. I, I don't even remember. And it's only one stain. So it, it's like really close to matching. But it doesn't match exactly. I'm really almost done with this, but it's 
So the blanket is going to be over 56 inches in length. Um, and I, I sat with it the other night and it hasn't been blocked yet either. So I think I'm going to keep it to the 18 the pattern calls for, which is about 200 yards. Um, and so I will get that done this week. I'm so excited to see the end of that pattern. I love it. I love the pattern everything. I'm actually not submitting it. It's just getting so big and heavy. And every single time I do a row at this point, I have to shift the blanket at least twice during that row. At least. Usually it's three times. And so the rows are not getting any longer, obviously. It's straight. Um, but they are taking longer and longer the bigger it gets of all the material hanging off the table. So I'll have that done next week. At least I really hope so. And so then the next thing that I've been knitting on, and I've kind of been cheating on the blanket, is the Merlin pattern by Usolda. And the yarn is Bush MCN, and it's out of the sport. Sorry, that was a really bad sentence. It's Squish MCM Sport in the Summer Gems colorway, which is a club colorway. Um, and this is a shawl for my aunt. Oh, I'm really sorry. Sorry. Um, my son, my sister. Uh, so I am almost done with it. It's a sideways shawl, and I only have this much. I have been taking this out for my knitting around town um, when I take my daughter to gymnastics and we start swim class. Um, the blanket is just so big at this point. I was taking it in the beginning, but now I look ridiculous carting it out in public. So, um, the last time you saw this was several weeks ago, and I was right here. So, I really haven't missed that much on it. I probably only have, I could finish this up right quick if I just concentrated on it, but I'm not allowing myself to do anything but that blanket. I'm almost done. And I cannot set it down and not finish it. You know what I mean? Like, when you are kind of sick of something and you set it down, like for me, it just sits there and sits there and sits there. It's ridiculous. I'm nothing good at, at fitting, and I have no finished objects except my own. Well, I can say but my own. I have no finished objects that I finish, but I do have something to show you guys. So, my mom's mom, my grandma, passed away more than 10 years ago where it does not seem like it could be that long ago. Um, funny how things like that work in your mind. You feel like yesterday, no matter how far in the past they were. But my grandma was a crocheter, and when she passed away, we all were able to pick things that we wanted and blankets that we wanted from her. And this is the one I picked. And why I wanted to show it is because this is the blanket I knit under. This is about a quarter of the size. It's pretty long. It's over six. I would say it's six and a half to seven feet long. And it's just a really simple pattern. But why I love this pattern. I love it. And I love this blanket as it's just wide enough to fit on my lap. And not wide enough for two people. Well, a lot of blankets are great. Like, uh, my husband's favorite blanket to have on his lap is a queen size quilt. He loves all the extra fabric. And I'm knitting, I don't really like that much. So, I always use this. And I love it. It's well loved and well used. And I think that is the best thing about handmade. Every single time I see it and I use it, I think of my grandma, who was a wonderful, wonderful person. She is dearly missed every day by so many people. And I feel lucky to have something from somebody that not only she needs, but I saw her use this countless times when she was her thing. So, really, one of the more special pieces that I have. And I didn't even make it. So, I guess that's part of the reason why I knit so much for other people, because I want them to have something that they can think about and say, someone really loves me and knit this for me, spend all the time on it in the world. So, and I think a lot about people as I knit, and I try to knit with love and put all the good vibes into a project that I can. And I always think that, you know, sometimes people don't appreciate stuff we make for them, but for that one person out of ten that does, it's worth it. 
It is so worth it. Okay. I'll get off my soapbox. So, spinning, still spinning the same thing. Totally boring. We're going to spin it. And we're going to go into sweater, which is our thing. And I'm doing good on time, so that's great. So I picked a free pattern that is quite popular right now to talk about what I do once I pick a pattern. So we talked about two weeks ago how we pick a pattern, how you search. Um, last week we talked about yarn composition and, and what the elements in your sweater have and what kind of yarn should be good for it and considerations to have there. We, didn't, we went in a little bit to color as well. So then the last thing is really when you start knitting your pattern. At this point, you pick the pattern, and hopefully you've knit a gauge swatch. Um, and so I routinely get gauge. Um, I really, really try to. The only time I adjust the pattern for gauge is if when I get gauge, I don't like the resulting fabric. Either then I will um, change my needle size to get the kind of fabric I want, or I will switch yards depending on my problem. Nine times out of ten, I get the pattern, um, what's called for in the pattern on the gauge. So I'm going to do this as if we got gauge. But as I go through this, you'll, I'll tell you how to adjust it for your personal gauge that you have if you would like to adjust. So since this is a free pattern, I'm going to show you the pattern, and I'm not going to violate copy, um, copyright laws. Um, so this is the harvest. By Pink Can Knits, and this is part of her simple collection, which is a collection of patterns that are uh, simplistic in nature to basically teach you how to knit a sweater. So, this is a great first time pattern. It is knit from the top down, and it is very simple, as it's called for in the collection. So, what I'm going to look at right here is, oh, sorry, backwards for me. So if we look at the pattern over here, this is called the diagram. It basically is a picture of the pattern knitted flat. So as you can see, the sides are all up and down. They're straight, which would indicate that there is no um, shaping in the sweater. And you can see that you want the front to overlap by several inches in the circumference. So the way she does her patterns, which is um, special, is that she has all of these measurements. She actually says A, B, C, and D, and then they correlate to this um, chart over here. So what I do whenever I do a pattern is I highlight the size that I need to make. You'll notice here I've highlighted two sizes. So I highlighted my high, the closest one to my high bust measurement. The 38 and the closest one is a 39. So I'm going to try to knit the 39. Um, the second thing that I have to do for my personal body type is that I am skinnier on top. I'm like a medium, medium large on top. And I'm a large on bottom. Thank you, daughter, <laughs> and having a baby. But basically, my silhouette flares out at my hips quite more dramatically than it's classical. And so on that part of me, I'm a large. So what I have to do is I have to adjust the pattern so that I am knitting a smaller size on top than I'm knitting on the bottom, bottom for each bottom. Which means that as I knit down, because this is top down, so you start at um, the collar and we knit all the way down, we separate for the sleeve, then we're going to knit the body from the armpit down. And when I'm knitting from the armpits down, I'm going to have to adjust that after I get below my bust measurement to incorporate extra increases to accommodate that larger part of my body. So basically, how do I do this? I would recommend the first thing that anybody does before they even knit a pattern, whether you can adjust it or not, is be all the way through it. And the second thing that I do is I do all my math and I figure everything out prior to knitting it. That way, when I'm knitting it, it can be somewhat thoughtless, but it's already done. I don't have to think, oh my gosh, I'm assuming this. I need to rip out an inch to get to where I need to be to start the increases. Um, forethought in 
knitting is important in everything that we do. All knitters are somewhat planners, I think, at least in some small way. And when you're doing an adjustment, it's behooving to you in a large project to try to think about it before, and it's certainly before you get to that section of the sweater. So, the first thing I do is highlight everything of my size. And every sweater pattern is knitted for multiple sizes. And I can say every, but the majority. So if we look at right here, he's got wonderful um, diagram showing you what's happening with the sweater, which is why it's such a good beginner pattern. This pattern is wonderful. I've read through it. And the instructions are very good, and the diagrams are wonderful. But you'll see over here at this side that her sizing goes from a 0 to 6 months old to a 4S. To accommodate all those sizes, she gives you stitch count, which is very common in sweaters, for where you should be, how many you should increase, how many times you need to do the pattern, or this particular section of increases or decreases to get your resulting size. Before I hit anything, I go through the entire pattern and I highlight it. Um, the reason for this is because if I'm knitting at 10 o'clock at night, I don't want to miss count and knit to the stitch number that is a size lower or a size bigger. It's much easier to take a minute and highlight. I do still print most of my patterns because I write all over them. However, there's many good um, electronic forms of this. Google um, Good Reader is really good. You, in those programs, depending upon the program, um, can highlight in that program. And when I do use the electronic format, I do, again, go through and highlight with the highlighter tool on those so I can, again, easily look and not mistake anything. I'd rather take five, ten minutes of really making sure I'm highlighting the right thing at one time than mess up late at night when I'm knitting, watching TV with my husband. I really don't love working back. I don't know who does. I mean, I'll do it to get it right. But if I can avoid that by a few minutes of preparation, it seems worth it to me. So because this sweater is knit, in, knit from the top down and it's straight, what I mean by straight is some sweaters will um, flare out for the breast uh, or bust, and then they will knit in underneath that bust line, and then they will flare back out at the waist, kind of giving you an hourglass shaping. This sweater, you can see from the, uh, di uh, the diagram that we looked at earlier, is straight up and down in none of those shaping. Not to say it doesn't have any shape, it's just straight up straight up and down once you get past your measurements for your bust. So when reading through this pattern, after I get to um, the task separating through the sleeves, it basically has a body section. So this is a section, it is just a few paragraphs, and you'll see that I wrote over here. This is actually what I would do if I knit this pattern. Um, so, I'm basically going to put this down, and I'm going to show you what I did to adjust this whole sequence to be able to fit my body type. There's a few things when you're looking at adjusting for body type. I don't have a large chest. If I did have a larger chest size, I would want to do most likely bust starts um, to be able to accommodate that kind of figure. I don't have that. Most patterns are perfectly fine in me. I've never needed a bust start in my life, unfortunately. Um, so you have to also look at where you're increasing. I am very um, proportional, thank goodness, for me. Um, but also, I tend, I'm getting, when I go down to my waist, I get wider which means that I'm proportional in how I put on that weight in my area. Um, I didn't go outward like this, so I have a belly, although my butt is just out, unfortunately. I had a big muscle. Um, and I might put in butt start to accommodate my butt. Um, but basically, you have to look at where you're weighted. If all my weight was in front, then when I did my increases, I would do them in a different area. So let's look at here. I was doing my increases to make to allow for more room. I would do my increases if I had a larger belly section on either side of the um, band here and out here at the outer edge of my sweater, only on the front side. 
And that way, my back, which stays straight up and down, will, the sweater will slowly up and down. But in my belly where it gets bigger, I'll have a bigger amount of fabric that accommodates me to wrap around that. If I had a belly and I did increase it both on the back and on the front, and I didn't space them on the front together, then basically what happens is, is that, um, the back is wider as well as the front gets wider. So instead of your back hanging where your back ends, as it gets bigger, that back panel is going to start wrapping around your front. Now, is that that big of a deal? It really isn't um, if you do it. Some people like their sweaters that way. I'm just saying, for me, if I'm going to knit a sweater, I'm going to knit it to fit me perfectly, the best way I possibly can knit it. And so for that, what I really need to do is I need to equally space my increases um, in the front and back because I get wider proportionally, and that one section is much larger than the other one. Okay, so I'm going to put a pop-up when we start talking about these numbers. I'm trying to help. So, I did a lot of math. So, I'm going to just talk about it, and I'll, I'll put up pop-up. So, I'm going to start out knitting a 39, and I need to end up knitting the 43 on the bottom part of it. So, when I'm looking at the body stitches, the 39 ends at 196 stitches, while the next size up, which I need to knit to, has 211 stitches. That nets out at 15 stitches different. So ideally, I would like to get to an additional 15 stitches inside my body of my sweater on the lower portion of it, so I have that extra that extra few inches to accommodate my weight. Most patterns will increase at an even rate, so an even number amount, two or four. This one, many times when it has two increases, increases at a rate of two. And so I would want to round that 15 up to 16 so it can evenly increase the rows in which I'm increasing. So now I'm looking at increasing 16 stitches. So the gauge for the pattern is 18 stitches to 26 rows to do a 4 inches of second. So what I'm really going to look at is row gauge. Because what I want to do is figure out how often I need to increase on a length, on a row, be able to get um, those 16 stitches increased evenly at the bottom part of my sweater. So if I did that, it is there's 16.5 rows per inch. So um, the total length of the sweater from the underarms down, and these are in the table. And if you don't have a table as Pink Canyon does it, it will be in the diagram or in the first part of the sweater when it talks about um, the characteristics of the sweater. But for this, it's 18 inches from the underarm. If you read through the pattern or you look at it, you will notice that the bottom part of it is in garter stitch, basically in a pattern. That, that's 4 inches. So really, I have 14 inches of stocking it and 4 inches in garter. Ideally, I would like to increase those 16 stitches in the stocking that portion of the sweater. So I need to work with that 14 inches of stockinette, and then I can have a nice 4 inches of garter at the width of my waist, and it will close nicely at the bottom. So, in the pattern itself already written, after I separate for the sleeves, it has increases. This is very, very normal in a sweater, because for most women's sweaters, you need to accommodate for that area. So you're going to have increases to make the sweater larger in that bust area after you take out the, the mass of the sleeve and the shoulder. And so for this sweater, you increase um, a repeat of four rows, and you do that eight times. That equals 32 rows of knitting, which you increases for the bust right here. Um, that is going to be about five inches worked on in the gate. And so what I really like and how I am built is that after I get through the bust, I have about an inch where I am straight. 
before my waist starts to move. So I want to knit that inch and stop in knit. So if we're really looking at it at this point, I have six inches where I already have increased built in and then an inch of uh, spring. So there's two ways I can look at that. If I didn't want the straight touch and I would have nine inches. If I had the straight touch and I would have eight inches left in the stockinette portion to do my increases. So by reading through the pattern and figuring out what I wanted and how far my increases go, I figure out that I have eight inches left in the stockinette section to increase 16 stitches. I'm sorry, this is a little technical. I'm trying to rush through it without rushing, if that makes sense. I'm almost done. So, if it is 6.5 rows to the inch, and I have 8 inches left, I have 52 rows to increase the 16 stitches. So all you do is you take those 52 rows, and you divide them by 8. And the, re me, the reason why 8 is if I increase 16 stitches, my increases, I'm going to do two at a time. I'm going to increase two stitches at every increased row, which means that I only have to do that eight times. So that gives me 6.5 rows. So really every six rows. So basically, through simple math, I was able to tell myself that I need to increase two stitches every six rows eight times. And then I'm going to have the number of stitches that I need um, for the bottom, prior to starting the uh, cup. So, that's how you do it. So, I'll, um, hopefully this helps you, and I put up pop-ups to be able to explain the math that I did. Really, you could do this with anything. Um, all you have to figure out is basically your gauge. Once you have your gauge and you know how many stitches you need to increase or decrease, anything like that, you can then figure out how many increased rows or decreased rows you need for the section you're working on. I did this all dependent upon the gauge of the pattern. If you're going to knit at a gauge that is different than the pattern shape, please first figure out the numbers in the pattern based upon your gauge. And then once you have that, you can work it out. So if my gauge is bigger than what the pattern calls for, I can figure out the ratio of how much bigger it is. Is it 5% is it bigger? Is it 10% bigger? And then I can basically figure out in the pattern what size I need to either knit, or I can independently adjust all the numbers based upon my gauge block. And then once I had that, I would basically go through this process and figure out how I needed to do any additional increases or decreases. Now this is not talking about anything about doing dark or how to do those increases. It's just basic math um, using um, multiplication, division, and subtraction to figure out base numbers. You know, knitting is pretty forgiving. If you do knit it and you hate it, rip it out. We can try again. If you guys have more questions, please feel free to email me, DM me on RAF. And I'll help you as much as I can. What I do next after I figure that out, lovely math, is basically I just I just wrote on the side of my pattern that I need to increase two stitches every six rows eight times. Um, the other thing that I do that's additional to that is I since I rounded that down to every six rows and it was six and a half rows. Um, that basically leaves me with 0.875 of an inch prior to I start the garter section. So it does provide me just a little bit of room. So if I try it on and it's still too small, I could, from the naked eye, right before I did the garter section, do another two. So I'm basically trying to, I would round down when I get these numbers. Um, if it tells me to do 6.75 rows, sometimes I would round up to 7, but a lot of times I round down to 6. Um, that rounding down just means it's a little bit more playroom typically to be able to figure out if I was off of my calculations or if I need a little bit more that I can add it in at the end. 
that's the end of the water thing. I hope that gave you guys enough information to be able to figure out um, every part of your first sweater and some helpful tips to be able to go on that path. Um, the next podcast will talk about podcasting in general. Um, that that will be that week's thing. Um, I know some people talk about that they wanted to start a podcast and don't have to go about it. It's, it's not easy anymore, at least from my perspective. Um, to get started. So I'll talk about that and the options that I know about and resources. And so that's next week. This week, we have enabling. I'm doing pretty good on time. I was really scared there for a while. And two things to show you guys. Um, the first thing is spinning. I got fiber. You'll notice I do a lot more fiber than I do with yarn. And I think once I started Wheel spinning. I don't don't purchase as much yarn at all. I purchase more fiber and then I spin for what I want. Um, I don't know. I don't know why that is, but it, but it is the way it is. So, um, I ordered this in Julie Spins um, Unclub, and this is called Snow. I don't, can you kind of see how it sparkles? I'm trying to move it so you, it can hit the light. But it is called Glimmer Comb Top. It's 84 superwash merino and 16% Selena, 5 ounces. So, really pretty. I have never spun a braid with Selena in it. Um, I, I did one, uh, bat that had it in it. It was like, I would hit the section and it would be like a chunk of Selena. Where this is more marble throughout seems much more consistent. And Julie, um, from Julie Spence has wonderful fiber. It's always very good. So, I got this in her unclub. And if you guys want to know what, what an unclub is, she has these, and she alternates between fiber and yarn. She has one up right now. That is yarn. And what she does is, she posts in a group, and you know beforehand, um, the colorways. Typically, there are two to three colorways, and then she'll give you a choice of different pieces. You can then choose how, what you want, if anything, how much you want, and what colors and bases you want. So right now, she has uh, three colors, and she has two different base options. So I could go in there and say, I only want the variegated colorway and I want it on shelf and stock and I want two of them to so dye them up and send them. Why is, why is it called an unclub? Is because most clubs you give them the money and then you get kind of whatever you get. Really nice. Um, I really enjoyed them from dyers that I trusted because it pushed me out of my color preferences quite a bit and it always gave me something in the end I enjoyed. Um, but I got what I got. It's not like you could say, hey, I really don't like this color and send it back and get your money back. You can't. That's what a club is about. It's about um, the price, basically. You only call it an unclub because you have the fiber base and the color is revealed to you ahead of time. And you can do it or you don't have to do it. And if you want one skein, that's great. And if you want ten skeins, that's great as well. So it's very fluid. Um, and it's a nice it's very nice. I, I really do enjoy it. And that's what I got from her last fiber club. Her fiber unclub. So the last thing I got are, I got these. They're so cute. So they're right and wrong size markers. i got to cover my face. There you go. And the butt, which is my favorite one, is the wrong size. And this is the right size. And they um, will go on my knitting. And that's by... Carta 6. She's on Etsy. They were super reasonable. They were $6. Speedy shipping to me. She did a great job. And they are wood. Uh, bamboo. And in the package, she also sent me this. They don't focus. Sorry, she's got to turn the block every time off. Look at little baby. Wait. Sorry. I know I'm a dork. Little babies. I love them. 
So that's all I'm enabling, and then we get the rest rinse and raise section. I hope everyone had a great weekend. I had a total awesome weekend. Um, I was able to go get my nails done. I love them. They're gray. I know I'm a total dork, but I love getting my nails done the same color that I'm working on with the arms today match on when I knit. That's right. I matched my nail color to my project. And it makes me so happy. So I went with my friend. We went to a new nail shop that just opened. And the guy did such a nice job on my nails. And I have one nail that's bright green. And that's just because I'm a weirdo. And I like it. I think it's funny. It's not really funny. I just think it's fun. Like, it makes me smile every time I see it. And uh, the guy's going to paint my nails and got my colors out. And I was like, okay, I want this one nail green. And the guy spoke no English. Like, really. Nuts. He looks at me. He looks at it. Looks at the nail. Looks at me. And he's trying to think of how to say it right. Cause he doesn't really know English. He's like, "What?" And I'm like, "Yes, one. One." I'm like, "Yes, I only want one in green." So he did my thing, and I'm thinking, "And man, if this guy thinks it's weird, I guess I really must be out there on the, my own branch, ready to fall of the weirdo zone with nails." And then I get home, and my husband sees it, and he's like, what? One nail that's green? And I'm like, again, maybe it's just a nail thing. No woman has said boo about it. Men, they don't know. They don't know how awesome it could be. See, we just embrace that side of themselves. So, we did that, and then on Saturday, we went for a bike ride. And the funny thing about the bike ride is, my daughter is five, and um, she's grown like a week. She's in size six, that's clothes, and she's five. She's almost in seven, which is scary. She's super tall for her age. So, the bike that we got her last year is too small. But, we haven't been on a bike ride this year before, and my husband's like, it's not going to work. And I'm like, oh, it's going to work. We're not going very far. And I'm not going to go buy her a new, brand new bike just because we want to go on one bike ride. So it was a disaster trying to get everything ready. Complete and utter chaos. It took us hours. We lost, Jillian was playing in her helmet and she lost it. She said she dropped it somewhere and we couldn't find it. We had to go get a new helmet. We had to pump up our tires. It was absolutely, ridiculously awful. But we persevered. And we went for a family bike ride. And so we're biking on the path, and it's um, it's a path along the river, and it's paved. And I don't know how many times we must have said, pedal, you need to pedal, stay to the right, stay to the right, go to the right, 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 right. Okay, now pedal. No, you have to keep on pedaling. So honestly, this woman passed me, and she's like looking at us like, oh, it's a quintessential family. My husband is behind my daughter going, stay to the right, someone's trying to pass me, stay to the right. No, keep on pedaling, I'm going to hit you. <laughs> and then I said to the lady who's, you know, passing and walking, and I go, I've been listening to that for an hour. But it was a good time. Oh, it's good family fun. And then we made cookies. You know, come on, do a little workout, and then, you know, make cookies. Seems like a well-rounded plan to me. The other thing that I'm doing, which I'm excited about, is that now that blanket has been, you know, I've been knitting on it for like a month. And pretty much I've been knitting only on that. I've been spinning a little bit, but I haven't really been cheating. I have really been trying to be faithful to that blanket. Because I know if I stop knitting it, it's going to be due. And I want to get it done. I want to get it and have it washed, finished, and woven in, everything. So, I told my husband that I'm daydreaming about, you know, my next project. He looked at me like I was crazy. Um, so, basically, my self-imposed rule is that I can handle, like, one new project, and then my other project has to be finishing something up. Um, and on my list of people I have to knit for, it's still six or seven people long. In the next few months, there's no way I'm going to get all of that done. So, I decided I'm going to knit something for myself. After the blanket of doom, and the only other thing I'm working on is that Merlin shawl, which is also for somebody else. I haven't knit myself something in months. So, 
in the, I think it's called Inspire Group or Inspirational Group. I'll, I'll do a pop-up of it. That is a group for a designer, and she has the pattern called Full Proof. And I think Amy Beth from the Fat Squirrel Cakes has been knitting this pattern, like the bejesus out of it. Um, or it was several weeks ago. I don't know. I probably watched 20 videos in about a week of hers, so it kind of melded together for me. Kind of catch up. I've been way behind it. So she's having a, a knit along in her group in April for that pattern. And I decided, heck yeah, I'm going to knit it. I'm very excited. Um, it's a different kind of pattern. And it's a cow it ends up being a circular towel in garter stitch with stripes. That fits the bill, doesn't it? I don't know what I'm going to knit it out of or anything else, but I just decided I'm going to participate. So I think I've only done one other cow ever that I finished and put a picture of. I wish that I could just like link my episode and say, hey, my episode's right there. Or all the time. But I can't. I have to take a picture. So hopefully, not only will I participate, but I'll take pictures and put them in there. If any of you have gone to my project page on Ravelry, you will see that I have nothing up there. I'm awful. And a lot of stuff I give away and I never take a picture of it, and then what am I supposed to do? So instead of just having something there that doesn't have a picture, I uh, never put it on there. I swear I have knit more than my project page revealed. A lot more. So, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. And I really enjoy doing this for you. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, please feel free to uh, email me or PM me on Ravelry. Um, and then I just kind of have a question to ask all of you. Actually, it's a few favors. So I've been doing this podcast for um, almost a year, or a year, I can't remember, the first day I did it. And it's a long break, and I'm really sorry about that. But I'm back on the horse. I've been consistent. I feel good about it. Um, and I'm very excited to do this again. Um, but when I went to go look at my items the other day, I only have three items with you. So, what, what does that really mean in the world of podcasts? Well, it means that I don't have enough reviews to get a star rating. When you don't have enough reviews to get a star rating, what happens is, is when anybody, like, searches for podcasts about knitting or hobbies or something like that, the more reviews or more recent reviews you have, you tend to go up and you are on a featured page or you um, come up within the first so many hits or something like that. Because I don't have a star rating, I don't come up. It's kind of sad to me, right? I'm kind of depressed about it. So, this is what I'm going to do. I haven't decided on the prize yet. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a prize. For every 10 people who leave me an iTunes review, you will be put in a bucket and you will win a prize. A bare minimum, it will be one skein of yarn. And we're of the good stuff. Let's be honest, the good stuff. It will be an indie diet uh, dyer yarn. Um, so I will get together a list of different prizes that are available in there and we can pick. If you do do an iTunes review for me, it can just be a star or you can write something. Um, and to be honest, I'm not asking anybody to lie. I mean, although if I got 15 one-star ratings and I cried, I would cry. And that might. I would cry. Totally cry. But that's okay. I mean, if that's what it is. Um, so just DM me on Ravelry. There are three people who already left um, iTunes reviews, and I will put them in the first bracket. So seven more people do it, we'll do a drawing. So you have one in ten chance of winning something awesome. And I'm very open in this uh, pie. So if you don't like the pies and you want something else or you want me to spin something for you or knit you a hat or something else, I mean, pretty much I'm going to be like, you can name it. I mean, I have the right to refuse if you go off, you know, off help a filter on me and, and, and are like, you know, give me that blanket. I'm going to say no. Respectfully. Respectfully. But um, I will try to make your dream come true. So a lot of that is part of what is in the ideal giveaway thread of why I'm trying to get stuff up is because I really want to give you what you guys want and have enough on hand that 
if you posted in there that you wanted hand spun, or you posted in there you want blue moon fiber art, guess what? I got some of that. I got socks that rock. And if that's what you, you know, say you wanted the ideal giveaway and you win something, that's what you're going to get if I have it. So I hope you guys will help me out there. Um, next week I will put something out of the statues as, as an example um, to give it away. And hopefully it won't take us that long to reach that giveaway. I hope you guys have a wonderful week and you get with lots of love. Thanks so much for watching. Bye, y'all.